From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Sports Line. Hey there, Sports Line on your television. Steve Levin here with you. Glad you are here with us. Man, is there a lot going on right now in the world of sports? It's kind of like everything has converged right here. We had the NFL draft over the weekend. We had the opening of Geodis Park with Nashville SC in the 1-1 draw yesterday against the Philadelphia Union. And then tomorrow night, you have the opening of the Stanley Cup playoffs, at least as far as the Predators are concerned. It's actually underway already. But the Preds play game one against the top seed Colorado Avalanche at Ball Arena in Denver at 8.30 tomorrow night. And we found out today that UC Soros, the star goaltender, will not play as we likely expected due to that lower body injury. We really know it's a left leg injury. He's out at least games one and two. Could be beyond that, but at least games one and two, he will not be able to play. So both the games in Colorado, the Predators will forced to go with a backup goalie and see they're going to be David Riddick who's been up here most of the season but only played in 17 games only started a dozen or it's going to be Connor Ingram a guy who was an all-star with the AHL team in Milwaukee but really has not had much success at all at the NHL level has hardly played at the NHL level at this point so of course lost in the season finale giving up five goals after the Predators got up four nothing against Arizona which cost them the number one wild card spot in the Western Conference so that is some big news indeed as the Predators get set for game one and game two they were going to be a big underdog in this series to begin with but no one and I mean no one is giving them a chance now with Soros limited, at least to start the series. And who knows? I mean, he may not play at any point in this series. And so no one is giving them a chance against the Colorado Avalanche. We welcome you to the program if you give them a chance or if you don't give them a chance. We can talk about that, 737-7767. We can also talk about that spectacular opening yesterday at Geodis Park. I'm curious your thoughts if you were there on what you saw from that venue. The crowd, the facility, the concessions. I mean, all of it's really spectacular. The one downside, I, I think, certainly is the parking and the traffic in the area. Tell me your experience about that. Was it good? Was it, was it bad? Was it what you expected? I don't know if it was, it certainly wasn't perfect, I know that, but I think people also understood going in, it's, it's game one, it's a new place, work out some of the kinks. I'm just curious what your perspective was on that. And also on the game itself, Nashville SC hadn't been home all season long, two months on the road, they finally get home taking on one of the best sides in MLS. They find themselves down one nothing, a bit unlucky in the second half, and find a way to gut out a draw and keep that unbeaten streak at home to now 18 months or 20 matches, which is the best in MLS. We'll maybe hear from some of those participants coming up on the program. But of course, the NFL draft this weekend took center stage and it's, it started right here in Nashville on Thursday night. It was kind of a ho-hum first round. Felt boring in a lot of ways through the first 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 picks. There weren't really quarterbacks coming off the board, a lot of defensive players, there weren't any blockbuster trades. It was just, other than the fact that it was in Vegas, it, it didn't have a lot of sizzle. And then all of a sudden, the Titans make the trade to send A.J. Brown to the Eagles. And it, like, brought the entire NFL draft to a standstill all of a sudden. You're talking about one of the premier wide receivers in the game, one of the best talents on the Titans team dealt off in his prime over a contract dispute. The Titans got the 18th pick and a third rounder back for Brown. They turned the third rounder as part of a deal. They got them multiple other picks. So in all, the Titans essentially get four players for Brown in this draft, including that 18th overall selection of Traylon Burks, a guy who literally comps out as an A.J. Brown type receiver. They're the same size in height and weight. He's just a touch slower Maybe doesn't run routes quite as well, but he's got better hands than A.J. does. He attacks the ball in a similar fashion. 
And we'll see what he can do in this Titans offense. The pressure is going to be on. There's no question about that because people understand what happened on Thursday night. That that trade happened, that his pick came out of that trade, and that he not only comps with A.J. Brown, but he is literally the guy they are selecting to try to bring in to replace A.J. Brown. But the biggest thing for me that I cannot get over out of this entire deal is how this happened. A.J. is literally the most talented offensive player or was on the Titans team. I mean, Derrick Henry's phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. He is the most important member of the Titans offense at this point. But he's pretty much a one-trick pony. You put the ball in his hand and he runs. He runs physical. He runs fast. A.J. Brown blocks well. He could run the football if you put it in his hands. And he is a terrific wide receiver. He gives you that extra dimension that they really haven't had other than that. And the other thing is he's a wide receiver and he's young. So if you start to look at the long term for the Titans, I mean, I don't think anybody thinks Ryan Tannehill is going to be there very long. How long can Derrick Henry keep running at the pace that he has been running? But A.J. Brown could be around for a decade or more. To me, it was amazing how this fell apart. Because he was the, one of the most influential players on the team. He was one of the best players on the team. And all of a sudden, in this offseason, where wide receiver deals went crazy. And they did go crazy. The market for wide receivers went through the roof. And that, credit to all of them, and congrats to them on getting deals. But A.J. saw that, and he wanted his. And he wanted it now, even though he's under contract for next season. And that's fine. When you have leverage in the NFL, given the way that the players' contracts are structured, you should take it. But somewhere along the way, it, it became this like strife between the team and AJ, and there was no reason for that. Because AJ had a great first three years here. The team loved AJ and what he did here. But all of a sudden, it became this thing where he gets on Twitter and he gets on Instagram and he's complaining about this and he's complaining about that. And he's taking things from no-name fans, people who've got like eggs as their avatar, as if that's somehow representative of what the organization thought about him. And you saw Mike Vrabel and you saw John Robinson saying everything they could to say that AJ's our guy. AJ is our guy and he's going to be here. Mike Vrabel went so far as to say that as long as he was the head coach, AJ Brown would not be traded. But AJ continued to go on social media and say those type of things. And then Debo Samuel requests a trade and things really start to blow up because then those two guys are talking on Debo's mom's Instagram live and AJ's saying they're not going to pay him 20 million or more. And it kind of aired the dirty laundry out there. But I also think the Titans had their feelings hurt. That AJ would go out and do that. That he wouldn't sort of follow the Titans' way of just show up and do your job. And at the end of the day, this deal happened on Thursday. And I feel at the end of it, it's like, I'm not sure the Titans believe they actually did it. I'm not sure they actually believe that they traded him. When John Robinson sat down on Thursday night, it almost looked like it just dawned on him that he traded away A.J. Brown. When A.J. sat down in Philadelphia today, it still looked a little bit like a guy thinking, did I really just get traded? I'm in this new home and I, I'm excited. I've got this new suit on. But did I really just get traded? And I just wonder as you move forward, what are the dynamics of all of this? Because number one for A.J., he got his money. He got a new four-year, $100 million contract from the Eagles. But the grass is not always greener. It's not always as green as that new suit he was wearing today. And let me tell you, whatever you think about Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill is a more proven quarterback in the NFL than Jalen Hurts is. The Titans are a better football team right now than the Philadelphia Eagles are. That's the situation he's going into. And yes, he got his money. Yes, he might see more balls thrown his way. But will he ultimately be a better player or in a better situation? I don't know. 
For John Robinson, it feels like he's betting that he can manage the draft and manage a roster well enough to overcome the loss of one of his best players more than he was willing to bet on a disgruntled star. And so he makes this trade that I'm not sure how many people would have done. And I think he's betting on himself, and we'll see. He's six for six in winning seasons as the GM. It's hard to complain about that. But this is by far his most risky move. And if it doesn't pan out, if he, if he doesn't find the replacement for that production, whether it be Traylon Burks or any other number of guys, the criticism is going to be huge. And perhaps for the first time, that seat as general manager might warm up for John Robinson as well. What about Mike Vrabel? He's the one who said this would never happen under his watch. Well, he's still here and A.J. Brown isn't. And if you read between the lines or looked at his mannerisms on Thursday night, you could see a coach that didn't seem all that happy. I assume he'll get over that. Mike Vrabel is not one to let distractions get him down or slow him from the mission. But if this wasn't his idea or he wasn't completely on board and he got a bit blindsided on Thursday, what does that do for his relationship with John Robinson moving forward? It's a fair question to ask, I think. And then the next question I think you have to ask is, what does this mean for Traylon Burks? I, and I know Jonathan Hutton, on Sunday Sports Central, both thought going into the draft that, man, it would be ideal if the Titans could get Traylon Burks. But that was in addition to A.J. Brown. And we didn't think it was possible to happen at number 26. And it, it wasn't. They got him because they moved up in the first round, and they got that pick at 18. So I love the pick of Traylon Burks. But I love it a little bit less that now he essentially comes in as kind of a co-number one with Robert Woods trying to replace what A.J. Brown did. And then you throw in all that other stuff, that he is going to be the literal comp in terms of a skill set, but everyone is going to compare him to A.J. Brown and the production that he's had over three seasons. Can he live up to that? That's a lot of pressure. And while I think Traylon handled himself very well, on Friday while speaking to the media about it all, he's going to have to deal with that day in and day out, probably through his rookie contract, until he earns the contract that A.J. got on Thursday night. He's going to have to deal with those comparisons. And how will that impact him and therefore impact the Titans' offense and the team? Those are the big questions that come out of that. The rest of the draft, I think the Titans did pretty well. I think it was balanced. They obviously came in with seven picks. They walked out with nine. They addressed needs. They got a cornerback that could start right away. They got an offensive lineman who could start right away. They got a tight end, which they needed. They got the wide receiver, obviously, that they needed up top. And then on the back end of the draft, they got a bunch of guys who I think can help them on special teams, if nothing else, and do it right away. So I think you really like what the Titans did overall in this draft. But this is going to be the draft that is remembered for the A.J. Brown trade forevermore. And again, for John Robinson, it's either going to be one of those things where you really prove how good you are by absorbing that trade and still putting a winning product in a team that can contend on the field, or this could be the trade that does you in, that loses the faith that you have built with the fan base, that maybe loses the faith that you have with your head coach and maybe even ownership. And that all remains to be seen. We don't get to judge that right now, but that's the type of move that was made. It was a move with serious ramifications for the future for a lot of different people, and we saw it all unfold right in front of us on Thursday night. By the way, it's been comical to hear how AJ said this isn't my fault and how it all happened, and even him talking today. Up in Philadelphia, he says there's no bad blood. The Titans gave him their chance. They drafted him. They started his career. But it just didn't work out. Yeah. And that's the thing I think we're all trying to figure out is why didn't it work out? Because it should have. And look, I don't think A.J. Brown's worth $25 million, and he got it, so he is because that's the market. But the Titans weren't going to pay that.
And I don't think they needed to pay that. But they were going to pay him significant money. And the fact that A.J. wasn't ready to go to their deal or that they couldn't work it out, that, that is something that I'm not sure we're ever going to get the full story from both sides. We've kind of heard bits and pieces from each side. I, I'm not sure we're coming to the agreement on what actually took place in those negotiations. But the bottom line is this. A.J. Brown is now a Philadelphia Eagle, and the Titans have to move on without him. Phone lines are open. 737-7767 is the number. And we begin tonight with Eric. Eric, what's going on? Hey, Steve. How you doing? Good. Listen, it, it's my thought of A.J. Brown straight now is going to get to the draft. When it first happened, I thought for a minute I dozed off. I was dreaming or something like that. And just I was kind of surprised, but I wasn't really shocked. I thought about it for a minute, but then after just realized what happened, I know a lot of times fans are mad, can't believe that this happened, and they thought A.J. Brown loved it and wanted to stay here. But here's the thing. I look at it this way. If Tommy Kill can leave the Kansas City Chiefs and go to uh, Miami, if Devontae Adams can leave uh, Green Bay and go to uh, uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, anything can happen. In fact, you know, hey, if, if the players have really basically two two options. Either you want to win Super Bowls, you want to get paid. You can do both, but it's very rarely circumstances. It's one or the other, not both. That's why Tom Brady took less money and got all those Super Bowls. But that's, of course, rare exceptions. That does ta happen. But, you know, I'm su surprised that Tyreek Hill would want to leave Kansas City and go to Miami because he's, I think, in a far worse situation with Tua. He's not going to have, I believe, the kind of production he would have with Patrick Mahomes, but I guess he's happy. He already got a Super Bowl. Devontae Adams doesn't. I think he's got a good quarterback, Derek Carr. He's playing with his guy who's considered his buddy. He's not as a great quarterback as Aaron Rodgers, but still, I think he can be productive. And, uh, of course, uh, A.J. Brown wanted to go and join Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia, and I hope it works out for him. He's got his money. I have no problem with him getting paid. But you're talking about he's playing for a city that the whole – and I'm a big Philadelphia 76ers fan, so I remember the whole Ben Simmons thing. The fans would turn on you if you don't play well, especially like A.J. Brown can't have drops, uh, which he's had sure. an issue somewhere in Tennessee. He can't be hurt because fans don't care. And I know he's had his uh, – you know, issues that he talked about, discussed with Titans about some mental issues and stuff. Yeah, they're not going to put up with that in Philly. And this was a city, I don't think they still do that, but of course I remember at the old vet, they had a judge on the side of the stadium as well as a jail cell for unruly fans. <laughs> and this is the fans that also remember fights where I guess a Philadelphia fan ripped off a of Washington at the time they were forming those Redskins or, or now the course football team jersey at the stadium. So the, these are some of the most brutal and just fans that you would ever imagine, you know, because you remember Michael Irvin got hurt, they threw a batter at him, they booed Santa Claus, so, you know, Philly fans are not going to put up with, with a lot. I hope it works out for them, but this is a guy, guy in the team with all the drafts and stuff they've had, maybe they'll play team, maybe they'll win the NFC East, but I don't think they're a Super Bowl team, but hey, he got his money, and I hope it works out for him. Now, now, as far as the draft goes, Steve, I, I'll be honest with you. When that happened, when we got the receiver that we got, Traylon Burks, I was saying, we got to get Malik Williams. That's what I was saying. And then when we got the second, we uh, traded out to down to the second round, and then we didn't pick, we got the cornerback. I said, okay. Then it got to the third round, and we got that offensive lineman. I said, what's going on here? You know, I was getting a little bit nervous. And then, of course, Atlanta got Desmond Ritter because I think Ritter and Malik Williams were one of the two quarterbacks we're looking at. And then we traded up to get him, and I said, we don't use this pick to make Malik Williams. I don't know what the Titans are doing. So when we got him, I was happy, but some would say the Titans probably lucked in to get him. But also, we got the guy that was from the Tennessee Vols that played here locally at Overton, which I was yeah. real happy to see in the reaction of his family and everything. And uh, got the running back from Michigan. I, I, it definitely seems like we're building the future. You don't want to give up on this season, but definitely when you give up your second best player, it's kind of not you wouldn't do that if you're definitely expecting to go to Super Bowl with all the moves that were made in the uh, AFC. So, you know, and I think Tannehill's probably here this year, maybe next year at most. Because I think Malik Willis is going to be the start either next year or the year after. And I wouldn't be surprised if this happens too. This could be Derrick Henry's last year because I think he's only probably going to be here another year or two. So it looks like going forward, this looks like a rebuilding move. And with getting rid of A.J. Brown, it may be we've handed the division over to the Colts. But we'll see. Good talk to you, Steve. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Eric. A lot of good stuff in there. I think it is going to be fascinating to watch exactly what happens here because for this season, I don't think you can tell yourself that this is a rebuild at all because that defense should be a championship-level defense. 
You've got Derrick Henry coming back at 100%, so you hope he is a dominant runner again behind what should be a pretty good offensive line, you would think. You did get a first-round draft pick at wide receiver to go along with Robert Woods. You have Austin Hooper at tight end. And you do have Ryan Tannehill. And Ryan Tannehill isn't Aaron Rodgers or whatever, but he's a solid NFL quarterback with this team. I don't think they're throwing the towel in on this season at all, but it is interesting because I think there's a really decent shot that by this time next year, Ryan Tannehill's gone, given his contract situation. I don't necessarily disagree about the Henry thing, depending how this season plays out. I mean, if he's wildly productive, I think he'll be back. I think they'd love to keep him as long as they can. He's a vital piece of what they do, but we all know that running backs have a certain shelf life, and he just had a foot injury as a six foot three, 247 pound running back. You know, maybe proves us all wrong this year and comes back and runs for 2,000 yards again. I wouldn't put it past him. He's incredible. But you also may see a little bit different looking Derrick Henry, which may change the outlook for what the next couple of seasons would look like for him. So I do think at some point you're looking at a changing of the guard with a lot of this stuff. The Malik Willis thing, though, is fascinating to me for this. I generally don't like quarterback picks there. I'm okay that he kind of fell to them, and they didn't have to give up a whole lot to move up and get him with that pick. But here's the thing. I feel like if you're drafting a quarterback – you better be drafting that quarterback in the first round because those are the guys that are sort of considered the blocks to be starters, right? Those are the guys that are considered to be the franchise moving forward. It's the Trevor Lawrence type of guy. It is a Tua type of guy. And sometimes they don't always pan out to be that way. Mac Jones going to New England, all that. But those are the guys who go into the draft and you look at them and you say, okay, they've got everything there. Now, whether it all comes together or whether they fall into the right situation, they have everything it takes to be a starting NFL quarterback and a good one. Malik Willis fell into the third round for a reason. Now, he's going to have some time this year because there's going to be no pressure on him needing to start in week one. But I do, con- I do get a little concerned that perhaps you just spent a third-round draft pick where you could get a player at another position that could start for you immediately or be a real impact player to draft a guy that may ultimately never get on the field. Because if we're being honest, if the Titans do move on from Ryan Tannehill next year without seeing Malik Willis play probably a whole lot this season, they're going to be in the hunt for a free agent quarterback next year or a guy in the draft. Let's not kid ourselves. That's absolutely going to be part of their mission. So I just wonder what that pick ultimately means. It clearly shows that the clock's at least starting, that there's some pressure on Tannehill here, that there actually is a backup in the building that they would feel comfortable putting into the game if they had to, not just because they had to, but because we can put them into the game now. That definitely happened with this pick. But whether Malik Willis actually can be the starter in the future for the Titans, that remains to be seen. And if that's the case, was that a worthwhile pick in the third round? We'll see. Back to the phones we go, and they are open, 737-7767. Let's say hello to Adam. Adam, what's going on, and welcome to Sportsline. Yeah, so I agree with you for the most part, Steve. And through your career, I love watching you because I agree with you for the most part. However, I think you're dead wrong on this draft. I know it's okay. uh, I know it's AJ centric, and you think in five years, what are we going to think about with that draft? I think it's going to be that we got Malik Willis in the third round. That's just he he that you give him in his NFL comps. People are saying McNair. He comes to Tennessee, and they're giving him McNair, uh, Liberty, <laughs> Alcorn State uh, comparisons. You know, and he's he was shredding with Liberty with nobodies, man. These were JV players he was playing with. He was just carving. I mean, he got beat a couple of times, especially towards the end of the season. But he looked so good, man. He was a man among boys. And that's kind of like Steve McNair. I'm not saying he's going to start. But what he's going to do is he's going to put pressure on Tannehill. And I think Tannehill needs that, uh, especially when you saw how much better he was when he got benched. 
Uh, he come in with a fire lit under him. Logan Woodside was never going to unseat him, ever. Uh, if there's a rookie on the bench, especially because you know these fans, man, we're crazy. Uh, if, if, if it comes down to it and Tannehill does something bogus, we're going to be calling for it, you know. Like we're, we're, we're not going to sit back and, and be quiet. So, uh, you know, I hope hopefully uh, Malik can sit there and learn and Tannehill comes out with like 40 touchdowns and five picks because he's got pressure on him. But I love him having pressure on him. Yeah, well, there's no question that that happened here, Adam, that they, and thanks for the call, uh, they, they absolutely are putting someone over the shoulder of Ryan Tannehill. They're starting the clock on Ryan Tannehill, so to speak here. There's no question that happened. I'm just saying that when you get that guy, and maybe Adam's right, maybe ultimately he becomes the steal of the draft. That happens. I mean, Tom Brady was a six-round selection, and he's the greatest player to ever play. It's not always just first round picks but by and large the guys that end up being starters in this league the guys that be, end up being really good players in this league they go in the first round somewhere and those are the guys that you expect to step in and the idea that Malik Willis fell as deep as he did in a draft where quarterbacks weren't really coveted so there weren't a whole lot of other guys you're looking out there saying, oh, that guy's really good. So it wasn't a great quarterback class. The idea that everybody allowed him to fall that far tells you that there's real questions about his game and how he stacks up into the NFL. Now he's going to have the advantage of not having to play right away. And he's going to give the Titans the ability to push Ryan Tannehill right away. But I still wonder, a year from now, if you haven't seen much of Malik Willis, even if you are moving on from Ryan Tannehill, what's the future for Willis? Because I don't think you probably go into the 2023 season just saying Malik Willis, here are the keys to the Titans because we're moving on from Ryan Tannehill and there's nothing else being done at the quarterback position. I think the Titans would very much be involved either in free agency or they would be looking hard to try to get one of the stud quarterbacks in next year's draft in the first round. And if that ends up being the case, how do you ultimately look back at that third round pick? Could work out great. Could work out exactly how Adam said. But I think there is a risk there for that particular pick where if you used it to just go get, say, an inside linebacker or something like that, you might have a starter on day one. Or you might have a guy who's a rotational player that plays a lot right from day number one out of that pick. Difference in philosophies, and I certainly understand it, but there's no question that move, in terms of what the draft did, I mean, A.J. Brown aside, you take the trade out of it, which meant you had to go get a Traylon Burks type of guy in the first round. The pick of Malik Willis is the most impactful for the Titans this year because it changes the dynamic in the quarterback room and for Ryan Tannehill. There's no question about that at all. We'll continue on here. Phone lines are open, 737-7767. If you'd like to get in on the program, lots to discuss. We'll be back with more after this.